have been a congressman since 2007 and was inspired uh, to uh, become, uh, to run for public office by his, uh, by his son who, uh, who uh, enlisted after the 9-11 attacks and uh, uh, was, uh, uh, kind of reinforced the family sense of, uh, uh, of public duty and, and uh, we certainly uh, understand and appreciate that. Uh, 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 Congressman McNerney is a, uh, is a member uh, of the Committee uh, on Energy and Commerce in the House. Uh, he is a PhD uh, in mathematics, uh, which already places him way above my pay grade. Uh, he is, uh, uh, has been an engineering contractor uh, and uh, uh, at uh, Sandia National Labs, I worked for U.S. Wind Power and Kinetech. Uh, there are wind developers and people who understand the value of transmission around Congress. Uh, Angus King, as on the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, was a wind developer, and and um, uh, so I, I think we have uh, a Congress that understands infrastructure and this particular infrastructure. Um, uh, I, uh, I I'm delighted to uh, to introduce uh, the congressman again. Uh, he is uh, a good friend and and he is also co-chair of something I hope we hear more about in the future, something called the Grid Innovation Caucus, uh, which is uh, maybe I don't know about 20 uh, uh, representatives who have a particular interest uh, in the grid and in the science associated with with the grid. So uh, I will turn it over to Congressman McNerney with my thanks. Thank you, Jim. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, Jim told a little story, uh, the start of a story, and I hate the a story that hasn't been told completely, but uh, when I was uh, working for uh, wind energy uh, companies and uh, PG&E and EPRI, uh, back in the early uh, 2000s, <clears throat> it just seemed like a, a good place to be. Uh, things were happening. Um, and then I got a call from my son. He was in the service, and he said, hey, Dad, I'm, uh, you know, I just got my absentee ballot in the mail, and there's, there's, there's no one on the ballot running against the incumbent, so uh, what are you doing with yourself? You know, I mean, I'm serving. What are you going to do? So uh, he talked me into running. Uh, before that, I had no real interest in politics other than complain like everyone does but uh, so it, it was a, it was a sort of a, an, an interesting way to get started <clears throat> but uh, it's been a challenge and uh, my, my background uh, um, as James said is uh, is re renewable energy wind energy I spent about 25 years in the business uh, I, I we got in the business when it was just starting and you were able to design uh, stuff from a blank piece of paper and that's always good in the sense that it's exciting and you get to put your ideas down. Uh, of course, the bad thing is that things go wrong that you don't foresee. Uh, and uh, I may have told this story to this group before, but uh, we, we got uh, investors to give us money. We designed a wind turbine on a blank piece of paper uh, and we, we put it together. We put it out in the hills of New Hampshire. We called the investors in, turned the thing on, and then the, everything just flew into pieces. Everybody was done for cover, including the investors. Uh, so <clears throat> there's always a, a, a difficult start, but you know the thing is that we kept going. We kept uh, we, we we got the investors to keep uh, uh, on with us. Uh, we improved the blade routes. We improved the the foundations, the generation, the transmission. All these things need to be improved until now. We see wind energy. If you go out into the plains uh, of uh, Kansas or or uh, Dakotas, you see these beautiful slow moving. Uh, devices out there. <clears throat> the tips aren't necessarily moving slowly, but it looks like they're moving slowly. So uh, it was quite an it was quite a uh, an experience. But uh, ever since the oil uh, embargo back in the uh, in the 70s, energy has been my passion. Uh, I want to make sure that the United States has the energy it needs, <clears throat> that it's reliable, that it's uh, affordable, uh, and that it allows us to uh, continue our March as the greatest nation on earth. So uh, that's always been uh, my passion. I understand the importance of investing uh, in renewable energy and in energy uh, products in general, in energy infrastructure. 
in general. Uh, one of the things I experienced in those uh, years in the development, uh, wind energy development phases, how a federal uh, interest, a federal investment uh, waxed and waned over the years. And what happened when it waxed, a bunch of new people came into the business. Uh, we tried to create new stuff. Uh, there was a big learning curve always because it was new people. Uh, and then we, we got stuff out there. And then the federal interest fell off. Uh, investment fell off. There were big layoffs. Uh, the stuff that we developed uh, went into the closet or went into the filing cabinet. Or worse than that, it went overseas. Uh, the Germans in particular and some of the Europeans saw that uh, we were falling off in our investment and they made those investments and they created the products uh, and uh, they've been selling those products. So we don't want to see this sort of uh, cyclical investment in our, in our uh, technology development because basically it just gives our stuff over to other countries. So <clears throat> that's been one of my uh, driving forces is to let's level this off, let's keep it constant. Uh, we need to invest in our infrastructure, we need to invest in our grid uh, transmission is one of the uh, uh, big uh, uh, bottlenecks, I believe, out there. Uh, we need to have uh, distribution. As we see the market changing, uh, renewals are becoming a, a significant part of our uh, energy mix. We see coal dropping off. Uh, we see uh, natural gas um, exploding, so to speak, uh, in terms of our energy mix. And, and all this needs, uh, it needs constant evaluation, needs constant investment. Uh, we need to we need to have our our grid and, and and everything ready for these kinds of changes i mean when you have a distributed generation uh the people at, at cal iso or, or the other isos around the country are experiencing uh hernias trying to figure out how to keep up with it so uh we need to make sure that we have the money and the investment so that they can do that um and uh, i think american leadership is is on the line we want America to be a leader, uh, both in terms of uh, technology and in terms of e exporting our technology and engineering expertise, uh, and also uh, giving our own uh, businesses and our own communities uh, the, uh, the energy with the, with the reliability and the price uh, points that they need to, uh, to thrive. So these are very big challenges. Um, <clears throat> uh, I was out. Uh, about a month ago, you know, in, in California, the hills are kind of greenish. It's, it's, it's backwards from the East Coast because in the summer, uh, it's brown out in California, and in the winter, it's green. Uh, and around here, it's, uh, it's green in the summer, and it's, I don't know what color in the winter. But um, we were out, uh, my wife and I were out uh, at a place in Contra Costa County called the Black Diamond Mine. And it's, uh, it's a, a place where uh, in the 1800s, uh, folks were out there mining coal uh, for local use. And it was beautiful and green, and we walked, uh, there's, a, there's a cemetery up on the top of the hill. So we walked up to the cemetery um, and looked at some of the grave markers, and, you know, there were, pe there were children that died at 10 years old of dysentery, and, and there were people that, that, that just gave their all for that, uh, for that business. And, and because of people were willing to make that kind of sacrifice, their lives and their families, uh, for American industry, uh, America grew, America became strong. Uh, and then, uh, ironically, <clears throat> this was up in the hill. When you turned around, uh, you could see across the California Delta. Some people call it the San Joaquin Delta. You could see across the Delta uh, and um, in the, in the Montez uh, Montezuma Hills in, in, uh, in Solano County, there's all these windmills, the new big windmills. It was like, what a transition from, from the hard, uh, just uh, back-breaking, work that these people did uh, and over to see the new modern uh, uh, generation. It was it's quite a transition just in just a few moments. So it just struck me as to where we're going and where we want to go. And of course, uh, we have a huge challenge of, of climate change. It's not going away. Uh, we've already uh, emitted, uh, uh, I think we're emitting, what, 30 gigatons of carbon uh, dioxide into the atmosphere every year. So we're already committed to significant change, but that doesn't mean we can continue to emit. I mean, uh, the sooner we reduce emissions, uh, the better off uh, we're going to be. Um, my main city of Stockton, California, is really kind of below sea level, and it worries me that if sea levels rise, uh, my biggest town could become 
uh, submerged. So I, I certainly don't want to see that or Miami or New York or, or Calcutta or all these towns that are on the coast. So we need to, uh, to be very uh, proactive in terms of how we uh, deal with that emerging problem. Um, <clears throat> but specifically in terms of the grid, uh, not in terms of generation, but in terms of the grid, we see these major events like a hurricane a Sandy and, and other uh, hurricanes and, and uh, natural disasters uh, threatening our grids. Uh, we see also a, a sort of an emerging threat from terrorism um, and, uh, and that needs to be, uh, the grid needs to be hardened, the grid needs to be modernized uh, so that when there are outages, so that when there's uh, some, some uh, parts of the grid go down that the, the grid can, can manage uh, the transition. And we see that happening today, and it's because of a private investment, it's because of public investment, uh, and the partnership that happens between those two things. Um, <clears throat> now, I think um, one, uh, another issue that I kind of want to touch on is uh, curtailments. Uh, I think last year there were 272 megawatt hours of renewable energy curtailed. Now, if you're in the business, uh, and you see a curtailment order, what does that mean? That means you're not going to get revenue. It means you're losing, you're losing money. Uh, and so that's, a, that's, a very, uh, that's, that's not a very progressive way to manage a grid. So uh, <clears throat> we need uh, demand-side management uh, and uh, regional cooperation. Uh, just the other day, CalISO was in my office. They are talking about how if they cooperate uh, regionally across the western states that they won't have to curtail uh, any longer that and that uh, the the grid will be much more stable at the same time so we have uh, plenty of opportunity left for innovation uh, and uh, and ways to make sure that we um, uh, use our, our resources in the most uh, effective possible way um, <clears throat> now I want to talk about the grid innovation a caucus um, I'm a co-chair of the caucus with uh, Bob Lara. He's from Ohio. Uh, he's also a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, as I am. And uh, we are committed to, to bringing, uh, I think the challenge we see with the caucus is, is sharing our passion and interest on, on grid issues, on, on electricity, uh, with the rest of the Congress. So what I'd like to do is bring uh, as many members uh, of our body uh, along with us in, in understanding the challenges and understanding the opportunities that this grid uh, is bringing us. And, and so that's, um, we've done several things. Um, we have a, a FAST Act uh, that I um, introduced last year, which uh, makes sure that we have a sufficient uh, equipment, such as tra uh, uh, um, transformers, when we have outages, so that we can quickly replace equipment when there's problems. Uh, we have uh, cyber. Uh, issues that we've uh, addressed legislatively. Uh, there was GRID01. We've involved the national laboratories. Uh, we're going to have a GRID Expo this summer. Um, and uh, we, uh, we're working on GRID resolutions. Uh, just, we just introduced a GRID resolution uh, uh, recently. So um, my aim is to, is to help um, inflame the passions uh, of my colleagues on this issue, on the GRID infrastructure uh, issue. So. Uh, recently, uh, um, <clears throat> in the last uh, Congress, we, we had uh, a pretty significant res uh, uh, legislation in the Energy Committee, uh, included hydropower uh, and included um, uh, resources, uh, how, how to develop uh, the, the people that we need for, for these jobs that are going to be coming up. As, as you all might know, we're seeing a significant number of fat wire people retire. Uh, everybody wants to do skinny wire and, 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 uh, and um, uh, uh, soft wire, uh, but uh, there, there's a real need for fat wire. Uh, and, and so we want to make sure that there's people out there that know how to, to do those jobs and do them well. Um, <clears throat> uh, let's see, anything else I want to discuss? Uh, a little bit of partisanship here. Uh, the House Democratic members of the Energy Committee uh, have an infrastructure plan that we put forth, which includes $4 billion uh, for grid uh, um, uh, investment. 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, we see that the President's budget includes a 21 percent cut uh, in infrastructure and in, in, in energy infrastructure, which I think is going in the very wrong direction. Uh, these dollars that we invest in our infrastructure are going to get a significant return on investment. So <clears throat> I, see, uh, I see some uh, um, conflicts, uh, political conflicts ahead as we, uh, as we try to decide how we're going to spend our federal dollars uh, in, the next, uh, in the next couple of years. And, and closing, I want to say that <clears throat> the consumers in this country in the last year, I think it was 20, uh, 2015 or last year or two, only spent 4% uh, of their household income on electricity. That, that's an incredible achievement. I mean, look what electricity brings us. It brings us uh, refrigeration. It, it brings us heating, cooling in our homes. It brings us lights. It, it, it powers our computers. And all this stuff is only 4% of our household income. I mean, that is an incredible achievement. Uh, and we want to keep moving in that direction. Uh, the, the more reliable, the more cost effective we make power, uh, the, the better off we're going to be because people are going to want to use more of it. And, and we're going to be able to um, <clears throat> uh, generate, uh, generate more uh, more uh, economy. So I think um, we have a, a, an incredible record. Uh, we have significant challenges ahead. Uh, but I see us moving more or less in the right direction. Uh, and I see my job is helping uh, to make sure that the federal government plays its uh, role in a constructive way uh, as we move forward into the next uh, decade or so. So those are my remarks. I think uh, James said there might be a few questions. I'll try my best not to answer them, but go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. <clears throat> uh, questions for the Congress? Yes, ma'am. Yes, hi. I'm uh, Barbara Tyron with the Electric Power Research Institute. Oh, Barbara. Thank you for mentioning us in your remarks. And Thank you for your um, leadership on the Grid Innovation Caucus, which is bipartisan. So that's my question. Um, a 21 percent <coughs> budget cut versus $4 billion for the grid. How do you see your Republican colleagues in you getting reconciled around those different numbers? Well, thank you, Barbara. And I do want to say uh, I did uh, work for EPRI for a, a number, as a consultant for a number of years, and it was, uh, it was a real pleasure uh, to see an organization that's committed to those kinds of things that, that I was passionate about. Um, I, um, the 21% the, the budget cut comes from the administration. Uh, and um, I don't want to say too much about that other than, um, you know, there's the, the administration, there's the, the Congress, and then there's the ju Supreme Court. Uh, it, it, it's really true that uh, the Congress controls the purse. So uh, I don't see that that 21 percent cut, it, it, it's, it's the ideal of the administration. Uh, I don't see that being shared widely in the Congress. Um, I don't know that we're going to get everything that I'd like to see, but I think we're going to get significant uh, uh, improvement over that 21 percent cut. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we were uh, able to maintain current spending or maybe increase that a little bit. That would certainly be, um, I think that's achievable for us. Thank you for your comment. Other questions? Yes. <clears throat> I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, how can we explain to the general public uh, what's in it for them uh, as far as their electric service and their costs and the future? Okay, thank you. Uh, that's a good question. Um, it, I mean, people take for granted what they have. As I mentioned, the, the electricity that we, we have really provides us quite a bit, uh, but I think you can, you can give them an idea that there'll be electric vehicles, they'll, they'll reduce their gasoline uh, costs, they'll, they'll be able to drive around town at, at a few cents a gallon instead of a few dollars a gallon, um, that, uh, the, the, and that uh, uh, I, I think that would be the best thing is to, is to concentrate on, on transportation, uh, because that's coming and I think it's going to affect everybody's lives. Uh, not only just uh, electric vehicles, uh, but the sort of um, the sort of improvement in our in our quality of life that that would bring uh, with 
with the integration of electric vehicles and uh, uh, self-driving cars, self-driving trucks, so that uh, we don't have the kind of congestion that we're seeing. Uh, traffic can be planned better. Parking uh, shouldn't be a problem. So I see these things as real uh, quality of life improvements in the next uh, 10, 10 years or so. Yeah. <clears throat> Good morning, Congressman. Good morning. My question is, uh, you talked about the bipartisan approach to uh, grid innovation. Uh, and you also mentioned your concerns about climate change and the, and the, the impacts of that. Uh, and certainly the World Health Organization agrees with you that that's probably the, one of the greatest threats to, uh, to, to well-being. Is there any, do, are you providing any feedback to Congress with respect to climate change or is there any bipartisan approach to the climate change issue? Well, uh, good. Uh, uh, an issue that I think uh, is, is a huge concern to myself and to many people. Uh, along with uh, the concern of, of our water availability, our, our fresh water availability, I think those are two biggest uh, concerns that I might have right now. Uh, and there is a significant energy water, water nexus, which I'm going to be addressing in legislation in the next f month or so. Uh, but um, the, the climate change issue I I is, um, it has been sort of a partisan issue for some reason. I don't quite uh, understand, but I had the privilege of going uh, with the chairman of the science committee uh, to the Arctic last week. Uh, and there was the, the impacts of climate change are, are more than obvious. They're, they're, if, you, if you're in the Arctic, uh, we were in Tool Air Force Base, which is on the northwest corner of Greenland. If you're uh, in, uh, they're saying, well, we didn't used to have mosquitoes. You know, we got them now. Uh, the people in Barrow, Alaska were saying, you know, the, the ice has, has receded away from us toward the North Pole, and because of that, the storm surges are bringing water into our streets when, when, when the weather gets bad. So uh, the, the data was more than obvious, and um, the, the members of the, uh, of the trip, the Republican members, were acknowledging that. Uh, and as a result, uh, the chairman has offered to work with me specifically on some, some small parts of the, of the climate issue. So I think there's a real opportunity here now uh, you know, as long as we don't make it into some uh, big them versus us or, you know, as long as we keep it as, as here, here, the, here's a policy issue that it's going to benefit uh, your, uh, your constituents. Now, uh, the chairman was very careful to point out to me, and I agree with him on this, is that uh, any action we take on climate change has to benefit the economy. If, it, if, it, if people perceive that you're doing legislation that's going to make their lives more difficult, they're going to throw your um, rear end out of office. It's going to happen. So uh, something like that happened in Australia not long ago. They had a, a carbon tax, uh, and the people were so angry that they threw that political organization out of office. So uh, we have to design whatever uh, federal policies uh, we, we come up with in a way that benefits the economy as well and make sure that people understand that it's going to benefit them um, because it's easy to misconstrue uh, policy when it's first initiated before things start taking effect. But I think there's a real opportunity on a bipartisan basis right now that's opened up in, in the recent, uh, in the recent last few months. Can I just have time for another couple questions? Yeah. As long as you allow me to eat that piece of banana nut bread I got. Okay. In, in the context of good green jobs, I was very upset about the Solyndra mm. issue. Those were innovative, really outstanding solar panels. And at the turn of the 20th century, all of Pasadena was passive solar. We developed that technology. What happened to Solyndra was the administration gave a lot of money and then let the Chinese send in their solar panels manufactured under no health and safety regulations. So what is the opportunity not to let that happen again while promoting domestic production and not being undercut by what I would argue would be an inferior product? Well, thank you. Uh, I, I think that's, that's an excellent point. 
a trade uh, benefits our economy in, in a real, real dollars and cents ways, but a couple of problems emerge. One is that the, the benefit is, is, is highly stratified, so a fairly small uh, po a segment of, of the of population benefits strongly uh, from, the, uh, from the economic uh, benefit of trade, and, and a large part doesn't benefit or, or, or loses. And it's like the old question, if you, if you have one foot in the fire and one foot in the ice, you know, you're pretty comfortable on, on average. Well, uh, that, isn't, uh, that isn't really a very good uh, uh, outcome. Um, but uh, I, I think that, that uh, trade needs to, uh, if we have regulations in this country that I think are important, that, that save lives, uh, that, that, that protect our, our quality of life, uh, protect our environment, uh, protect our workers, uh, lives and health and safety, uh, and, and then uh, we're competing company, uh, farm farmers and businesses that are following those regulations that are competing against countries that are not following uh, regulations that have child labor or uh, health and safety uh, violations uh, that we would consider violations or uh, um, uh, pollute the environment in an unacceptable way, use uh, insecticides that are banned in this country, then they're not competing on a fair basis. And I, I'd like to see trade agreements in, in some way reflect that, uh, that mismatch. And I don't know exactly what the answer is, but uh, and, uh, I won't be supporting trade agreements that don't take that kind of thing into consideration. One more question? One more question. I have one, I have one question I'd, like, I'd love to ask. <coughs> the president of budget uh, it does pay attention to transmission, but in an unusual way. Uh, it proposes to sell uh, all the transmission in BPA, uh, the Western Area Power Administration, and SEPA, um, which, which is uh, uh, I, I, I certainly adds to FERC's jurisdiction, but that may not be the only consideration. Have you have you thought about what the impact of that might be? Uh, no, I haven't really uh, come across that too much yet. Uh, uh, James, um, I mean, that, that, the, the, the prognosis for this budget isn't very good to begin with, but, I, but that is one area that is really kind of an unprecedented proposal. Well, I mean, I, I don't see, I, I'll, just, I'll just be flat out honest, I don't see the budget proposal as a serious document. Uh, I mean, the, real, uh, the real work is going to take place over across the street. Um, that is, is more or less a an opportunity for the administration to show what its priorities are. And the, but again, the responsibility for, for creating a budget for spending is, is with the body that I'm a part of. So don't get too, too worried just yet. <laughs> well, we, we uh, look forward to infrastructure legislation. Do you have any idea what, what, what you'd like to see in it? Well, I, I, you know, I think uh, I mentioned that the, the, the Democratic uh, part of the Energy and Commerce Committee has proposed a uh, infrastructure package. I, I support that idea. I'd like to see more. Um, and, uh, but the problem, of course, is where do we get the money to do these things? And, uh, you know, nobody wants a gas tax. If anybody sticks their head up above the trenches and say, I want a gas tax, you'll be shot. You know, you'll be gone. So uh, vehicle miles traveled. You know, the thing is that these, all these new vehicles have so much technology in them, uh, it's not going to be hard to, to implement a vehicle miles traveled, uh, maybe vehicle registration fees. I don't know exactly. Uh, I, I, again, I'm, sticking, I'm starting to stick my head out, and I'm starting to see the, the fire go by. So um, I, I, I want to be a part of whatever solution, uh, but I can't do it myself. I have to have my colleagues join in with me. Uh, but. We need more infrastructure, uh, not only electric grid, but we need more money for our water infrastructure. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, water, clean water uh, access is, is a critical part uh, of, of civilization. We, if we let that wane, we're, we're really in trouble. We have um, <clears throat> our roads and our bridges, our, our air traffic control system. We're, we're undermanned on, on our, our air traffic controllers. I mean, all of these things need real investment, uh, broadband access so that we can have uh, so bit small rural areas like part of my district so people have opportunity to, uh, to grow their businesses. So 
we need to figure out how we're going to pay for this, and we need to ask the American public to give us the resources to do it. Well, join me in thanking the Congressman.